It's 8.30 and we are about to start this webinar on mitigating climate change across the wine industry. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are tuning in from. Thank you, Hina, Kiram, Richard, that is just joining us. Yago and Dr. Richards, thank you for joining us for another Climate Talk by Porto Protocol. It is quite an unique session for a number of reasons. First of all, it is an initiative by Dr. Richard Smart. Smart. Chances are, if you are somehow an agent of the wine world, no matter where you are, you are acquainted with his, with his name, as he is a renowned viticulturist and international consultant. Lucky for us, we recently welcomed him as a member of our Global Steering Committee, joining our other inspiring and knowledgeable members, Diana Seitz, Gregory Jones, and Nuno Gaspar de Oliveira. Dr. Richard is with us today, although you can't see him, he's on the other side of the screen as well. So we welcome him and thank him for being a part of this think tank of Bioporto Protocol, Dr. Richard. It is also a climate talk with a twist, and I'll explain to that to you in a minute. And last but not least, a shout out to all the students and teachers at the Trazos Montes and Douro University, who are live with us today, you only can see them now. <laughs> now, I, again, as usual, let us introduce Porto Protocol to all of you on the other side of the screen. We are an international foundation building an open platform of climate solutions spread across the wine value chain. We have an enormous ambition of acting as a catalyst for climate action within the wine world. Our strategy to fulfill this ambition is by doing it together to build a collective voice, and most importantly, through collaborative sharing. Every day it's a challenge for us to know how to make this happen. To achieve it, to make it meaningful, we need our community of members spread across the wine value chain from different wine regions, different sizes, different stages of climate action to share with this growing community what they are doing to address climate crisis. I have said this a few times, but it is very important to reinforce this message. We are not looking for perfection. We are looking to multiply action, to trigger action. And this statement is an invitation to you on the other side of the screen to act and to join us. We are a click away and we would love to meet you. These climate talks are so much more than webinars. They are one of the tools we have of achieving this mission of ours, having people from completely different regions, completely different profiles, companies, share with our community their experiences, the best they have done and that they know how. And as I mentioned previously, this climate talk on mitigating climate change across the wine industry is somewhat unusual. Reason being, it will be the first research edition of our climate talks, slightly different from the previous sessions. We will have a series of presentations focused on different research topics, either from a scientific or market approach, on different components underlying the decision to mitigate. We have uh, one of our first guests is Kieran Harlem from the Australian Wine Research Institute, We'll present life cycle analysis and carbon footprint to demonstrate how the, our traditional 750CL bottle is an important component of the industry's carbon footprint. We have Hina Panchastara, from, also from Australia, from the Central Queensland University. We'll describe how pyrolysis enables the industry to convert waste streams from vineyards and wineries into energy. And in a completely different approach, we have Richard Halstead from Wine Intelligence, who will discuss how the glass bottle, again, can be replaced by alternative packaging and how consumers can react. Also, we'll be looking from Richard into organic and sustainable wine. Now, these presentations will be focused uh, on a discussion, mod uh, this presentation, sorry, will be followed by a discussion moderated by Tiago Alves Souza, who we, we handpicked from around the world to sort of translate to bridge the gap between these conclusions resulting from research to the day-to-day -day life of the vineyard and wine sector. And Tiago is joining us from Portugal, from Alves de Sousa, and he's also a professor at UTAG, which is the reason why we're live today at this university. And so without further ado, I, take, I thank you once again for being here and pass on the words to Tiago and I'll disappear from now. Thank you, Tiago, the stage is yours. 
Uh, thanks, Marta, and thanks, Porto Protocol, for the invitation, for your words, and for bringing us all together. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this climate talk and to share this great panel with key people like Hina, Kiran, and Richard on a subject that is so important and dear to us all. Allow me to address a special word to our dear mentor, Dr. Richard Smart, who idealized with Porto Protocol this climate talk. Anyone that ever studied viticulture is familiar with the extraordinary work of Dr. Smart, one of the greatest viticulture specialists in the world and a true viticulture hero. With great sorrow for us all, Dr. Smart wasn't able to be sharing the stage with us today, but I know that his vision and wisdom will inspire us all to bring important ideas to this table and make it a really meaningful climate talk. Uh, we have here a brief message by uh, Dr. Smart that I'm pleased to share with you, along with, uh, with uh, and I'll also share a small um, image that, that he uh, very, very kindly shared with us as well. So let me just uh, turn it on now. Okay, so here we, here we are. Um, and so let me just, okay, just one brief second. You have over there, exactly. Okay, so here it goes, Dr. Richard Smart message. So the webinar is about mitigation. That is the reduction of carbon footprint of the grape and wine sector. Mitigation is the name of the activity of avoiding the causes of the climate crisis so that it might. Okay. No. Just one technical uh, issue. I'll just one second. Okay. I'll start again, sorry, with a, with a, a small technical uh, issues, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on. So I'll begin uh, with uh, Dr. Smart's uh, message. So uh, here in its words, his words, the webinar is about mitigation, that is the reduction of carbon footprint of the grape and wine sector. Mitigation is the name of the activity of avoiding the causes of the climate crisis so that it might not eventuate. Mitigation is an ethical more than an economic decision. It is a decision that an industry may take to help guarantee its future in the same spirit that this decision is currently being taken by countries and states and by communities and families. This webinar investigates three components of this decision to mitigate. Firstly, Kieran will introduce life cycle analysis and carbon footprinting to demonstrate that the 750 mil glass bottle is a major component of the sector's carbon footprint. Hina will then describe how pyrolysis allows the industry to convert vineyard and winery waste streams to energy. And finally, Richard will discuss how the glass bottle may be replaced by alternative packages and how wine consumers may react. For those in the grape and wine sector who are considering a response to the climate crisis beyond adaptation should find encouragement in this webinar to begin contemplating mitigation. And uh, we have this uh, brilliant picture of Dr. Smart uh, with a, a glass wine bottle and uh, one new kind of uh, option that we may have for our wines. Um, and of course, you know who's, which one is the, 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 the elephant in the room. So mitigation is our key word today. Uh, and basically it means that we have to do better. Uh, mankind has been inflicting injuries to our planet for ages by many, by many ways, and we all have our share of responsibility, wine sector included. Nature is extraordinary and has extraordinary resources to react and fight back, but at the same time, we, if we do nothing, it will reach its limits. So now we have to do our share. We can't just put our arms down, defeat it, and just thinking to adapt to these new conditions. We have to do much more and take real measures that will help reverting this already dramatic scenario to save our planet. We owe it to us, we owe it to our future generations, we owe it to our planet. Mitigation is the word. So today we'll approach different levels of action that we may adopt in our vineyards and in our wineries and in our sales. 
I'll pass the word to Kieran Irlem, Senior Project Engineer at the Australian Wine Research Institute, who will present some of his excellent work regarding carbon footprint studies. Kieran, up to you now. Thank you, Tiago, and thank you, Marta, for the introduction. I'll just share my screen. Sorry, I believe you just need to stop sharing your screen, Tiago, and then... Thank you. I'll just share this one now. Okay, fantastic. So yeah, thank you very much, Marta and Tiago for the introduction and hi everyone. And thank you very much to the Porto Protocol and Dr. Richard Smart for the opportunity to present today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Kieran Hurlam and I work for the Australian Wine Research Institute. And today I'll be talking about understanding the carbon footprint of the wine industry. As we know, carbon emissions, or more generally greenhouse gases, contribute to global warming, which has been described as the greatest challenge of our time. The world is transitioning to a low carbon economy, and this is playing out in many key markets in the wine trade in the form of product-based sustainability criteria. The Australian Wine Research Institute has extensive experience in helping vineyards and wineries measure their carbon emissions, which is helping to drive process efficiencies, manage environmental impacts, and improve market access. And this will form the elements of my discussion today, along with details of potential mitigation strategies for producers. So the carbon footprint of a product is described as the direct measure of greenhouse gas emissions, commonly expressed as carbon dioxide equivalents, caused by a defined activity. In our case, wine production is the defined activity, and we are able to represent the carbon footprint of wine on a kilograms of CO2 equivalents per litre basis. For the Australian wine industry, in 2017, the estimated carbon footprint was 1.6 million tonnes of CO2 equivalents. On average, the carbon footprint per litre of wine was estimated to be between 0.6 to 1.4 kilograms of CO2 equivalents. These values have been seen to align with global studies. I think it's important to note that as a point of reference, civil aviation in Australia was estimated at 22 million tonnes of CO2 equivalents, which is significantly higher than the wine industry. However, that doesn't mean that the wine industry can't play a key role in developing mitigation strategies to improve its carbon footprint. To develop these figures, evaluating the carbon footprint of the wine industry, we used a process regarded as life cycle assessment. Life cycle assessment is a method for assessing the environmental impact and performance of processes and products. Life cycle assessments are typically said to be either cradle to grave, considering all impacts from extraction and processing of raw materials, through to use, recycling and disposal, or cradle to gate, considering all impacts until the product leaves the producer. For example, a life cycle assessment on a bottle of wine may be performed up to the winery gate, or to also include transport, sale and disposal of the packaging. The indicative cradle to grave carbon footprint of Australian wine highlighted that grape growing and winemaking gave similar contributions to the carbon footprint of wine at 15% and 17% respectively. Transport and glass packaging were obvious hotspots in the studies, together representing approximately 68% of the average life cycle. And these considerations will be touched on further within the presentation. In addition to this, we'll discuss one hot topic around fermentation release of CO2 as we work through our presentation. So in grape growing, diesel use, electricity used on site, and electricity used by irrigation providers were the main contributors to emissions. On the winemaking side, electricity was by far the biggest contributor, accounting for 82% of emissions. So as just mentioned, in the vineyard and during grape growing, diesel use, electricity used on site, and electricity used by irrigation providers were the main contributors to emissions. A few mitigation strategies that have been proposed and adopted for viticultural practices include improvement to management practices, whereby considering multi-purpose passes where tractors have front and back end operations, this could be included for like spraying and cultivation, um, as, and further enhancing spraying efficiency across multiple rows to minimize tractor passes, to minimize diesel use. This further lends its hand to future transitions to electric tractors to minimize diesel use, and there are presently commercially available options used in European vineyards. Furthermore, there are opportunities for the use of agricultural waste as a biomass source for renewable electricity production, including the use of prunings 
or other biomass for pyrolysis and the incorporation of biochar into the soil as a potential carbon store. This will be further spoken about by our next presenter, Hina. Now onto the winery and looking at energy use, we see refrigeration is by far the biggest energy user in many wineries and can be up to 70% of the electricity bill. When looking at mitigation strategies in the winery, we need to understand that there exist low cost improvement opportunities associated with changes in operating practices and higher cost improvement opportunities, which involve more significant modifications. Some low cost improvement opportunities include incorporating dual set points for refrigeration to make use of both off-peak electricity, as well as the higher efficiencies you will get at night with lower ambient temperatures. The practice is essentially to use a lower set point at night and a higher set point during the day so that most of your cooling happens at night and the plant only needs to be on during the day if it's required. It's also important to assess the temperatures of different operations and do they need to be so cold? Simple maintenance to the fridge plant and other operations can further prevent your system from running at its optimal performance and everything boils down to efficiency. If we can optimize efficiency, we can then um, make limitations to how much electricity used and all of this has a role on effect. Another consideration is nighttime harvesting, which is important in order to bring in cool grapes to reduce the load on must chilling. Obviously, scheduling, of course, needs to be able to cope with this. A few other operational practices could be flotation as an alternative to cold settling, whereby using nitrogen gas to remove grape solids. This process is quicker than settling and there's no need to warm up the juice again before ferment. Continuing settling is probably more suited to large wineries, but you can do batch settling in the existing tanks for smaller wineries. So there are ability to adapt between winery size. Also assessing cold stabilization alternatives. You could look at something such as CMC or KPA, um, which are inhibitors rather than removing tartrates through traditional energy intensive cold stabilization methods. Next, let's look at things around alternative energy options that can help you reduce your reliance on the grid. Uh, for instance, solar panels can convert solar energy directly to electricity. And understandably, um, within Australia, this is a bit of a luxury, except for today where it's been raining all day, um, but a um, bit of a luxury compared to other countries, but they are still a useful option. Solar panels can be mounted on roofs and buildings, but generally one downfall is that you have to be able to use the electricity generated on site. Finally, battery storage is an expanding field and these systems can also be integrated with solar storage um, and they can also provide short-term backup from power outages and can be charged from the grid if need be. Commercial and industrial batteries are an expanding market which should be investigated. Now I'd like to have a look at packaging and the impact of glass on CO2 emissions. So bulk wine leaving the winery is far less emission intensive than bottled wine, but only because the bottle hasn't been made yet. The packaging still needs to be produced in the destination market. This shifts the glass production emissions outside of the export market, but given global warming is a global problem, this, this may not provide any benefit. There is, however, plenty of benefit in the transport efficiencies provided by not shipping the glass mass. Whether these benefits outweigh bottling emissions depends on whether glass production in the destination market is less or more carbon intensive than it is in the export market and by how much. This generally comes down to the recycled content of their glass production. In Australia, this is approximately 30% and also their local electricity mix. In Australia, this is relatively high portion of fossil fuel. For wine packaged in glass, glass bottles are the single biggest emission source. The emissions are strongly tied to glass weight, which has led to a considerable shift towards lightweight bottles in recent years. The current technical limit is approximately 330 grams for lightweight bottles for a 750 ml steel wine. This saves approximately 15% of the total carbon footprint compared to standard 500 gram bottles, including savings on transport emissions. Conversely, a premium 750 gram bottle can increase the carbon footprint by about 20%. Cask or bag in box packaging is much less energy intensive than glass production. Wine packaged in a cask is approximately 40% lower in emissions compared to standard glass bottles. And there is very little difference between cask sizes on a per liter basis. 
Let's now look at ferment CO2. CO2 emissions from ferments are generally not factored into life cycle assessments as they are part of the short-term carbon cycle and are thought to be offset against emission uptake by vine. But a main consideration with ferment CO2 emissions are that they are such a concentrated source of CO2 and hence carbon capture provides an opportunity for the wine industry to further mitigate industry emissions. While carbon capture from ferments provide a good opportunity, it is important to balance the pros and cons of capture to ensure it does not limit efforts to reduce CO2 emissions from other aspects of wine production that could provide more significant emission reductions. Carbon capture has been implemented in the brewing industry for many years. However, current limitations in the wine industry include seasonal fermentation, tank distribution, and technology advancements in this area. There are multiple companies as shown on the screen that have developed CO2 capture and reuse systems for the wine industry with initiatives including, including pulse air agitation for red ferments, uh, conversion to solid form for storage or reuse. And one thing to consider is that the more people who look into this area, the more adoption will continue to expand this industry and the more accessible the opportunities will become. So in summary, Life cycle assessments are a great tool for understanding design stage elements of a process and identifying hotspots to drive improvement. Life cycle assessments are useful at assessing a broad range of environmental factor contribution assessments and great for telling stories about a product for conscientious businesses. It is important to note, however, that life cycle assessments are not designed for product comparison and they do not model social and ethical issues. However, the stories they tell can be used for engaging stakeholders or internal staff to provide clear messages on a business strategy. A final note I would like to make is to quickly touch on a program that is being undertaken here in the Australian wine industry as a tool to better understand emissions. Sustainable Wine Growing Australia is the Australian wine industry's national sustainability program. The program takes a holistic approach to managing, supporting and promoting sustainability. Sustainable Wine Growing Australia is modelled on a global best practices and aligned to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals with progress towards these monitored annually. It is administered by the Australian Wine Research Institute with government's endorsement and active support from Australian Grape and Wine and Wine Australia. If you're at all interested in this and exploring it further, um, please feel free to visit the website provided. Finally, in conclusion, I'd like to thank all of the funding bodies and AWRI members past and present who have contributed to this work. I'd like to thank the Porto Protocol and Dr. Richard Smart for convening this webinar. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Okay, thanks, Kieran, for your presentation. Uh, definitely a very clear and complete picture of our discussions uh, theme. We'll now continue with our, with our second speaker, Ina Panchasara, lecturer in engineering US patent award for lead invention at Central Queensland University, Australia. Ina will introduce us a new way to deal with vines and wines, waste to products, help the environment and still get some income out of it, which sounds great. Uh, Ina, the stage is yours. Thank you, Diego, and uh, thank you, Marta, Christina, and a special thank you to Dr. Richard Smart for um, introducing us to Porto Protocol, and also thank you, Porto Protocol, for giving us this opportunity, and to all the listeners um, um, everywhere that you are, um, thank you for joining us in this webinar, and uh, I'll be now sharing my screen. Um, <clears throat> So today I'm going to be, um, thank you, Kieran, for giving uh, the uh, insight into the carbon footprint and the life cycle assessment. I think this actually falls uh, into a continuation um, where I, I'm, I would be talking about the productive uh, usage of the vineyard and the winery biomass through um, a very intelligent, smart, and very interesting uh, technology known as paralysis. So my name is Dr. Hina Panchasra, and I'm um, working uh, as a researcher and an academic for Central Queensland University, and I'm based in Melbourne. 
So uh, with the, uh, it's very important for the vineyard and the winery sector to understand that there is uh, an awareness that is needed. And I think we are all on board to that awareness. We have tried to adapt ourselves uh, towards the climate change uh, measures and taking, facilitating all of that that is required um, for that awareness in order to adapt to uh, the newer ways. What important message I want to convey today is about mitigation because we need to be also very uh, um, careful um, and also we need to facilitate through our practices more and more uh, emphasis on the mitigation strategies uh, so that we can curb this, um, this concerns that are there in the climate change. Um, what is, uh, what is the motivation uh, for all of this? Well, within the vineyard and the winery uh, biomass waste that is generated, I think it's a great alternative to the fossil fuels, right? Because we all know that there is, there is a dire need for a replacement of the fossil fuels or something that can go, uh, that can take up a major, um, major um, role in terms of replacing the fossil fuels. These uh, these waste uh, derived sources can be a great uh, can be independent uh, sources of energy, and there is a global demand for any kind of alternative sources which are uh, which are a part of the renewable energy. Um, it uh, it has an increased utilization of waste because you can mobilize uh, most of the waste in terms of generating that clean energy, clean power, clean fuel. Um, in terms of the pro, in terms of the output, you get reduced emissions, um, and then the composting of the residues, you actually generate uh, the lesser carbon, and your carbon footprint is reduced. So, what are the current issues um, that we kind of know of uh, that are with the vine vineyard and the winery uh, waste? Well, they are they are of low um, value. There's a bulky uh, waste uh, which, uh, which adds to the cost of transportation. Uh, piling and burling is also very costly. Uh, landfilling is costly. Uh, releasing of uh, this, all, all of this collectively, it uh, actually releases a lot of pollutants and we actually uh, want to deter away from that or we want to actually reduce as much as we can. Um, and these are some of the things that can be utilized and mobilized in terms of the winery waste. So anything that is there, the grape mark, the stalks, the uh, prunings, everything. So all of the collectively, the vineyard and the winery biomass waste. Now, this particular slide uh, um, actually shows a good picture of uh, uh, the scale of the winery in terms of the grape crush uh, with the small, medium, large, and very large winery with the wine produced. Uh, the grape mark that is produced in terms of tons and the number of wineries that are there in each uh, category. Um, and the interesting fact is that uh, with the, uh, the grape mark, uh, I want to just highlight some of the important points is that the moisture content of the grape mark is about 55 to 75 percent. Um, there is 5% uh, of the fruit weight um, are the stalks and they can be easily air dried and used as well. Prunings, uh, which are about 20% of the grape weight, um, and they are at about 60% moisture content. They can be air solar dried, and they can be reduced to about 15% uh, of moisture content. So all of this um, is, is something as that you can use as terms of the way collective waste product in terms of producing uh, the cleaner uh, output that we are gonna be looking at before the slides. So what is the solution? The solution that I'm wanting to propose uh, today is about uh, using a uh, pyrolysis uh, technology, which can actually, as shown in this, which can actually take up any kind of the vineyard and the winery waste. This is a, um, a very uh, smart uh, mobile pyrolysis unit. And then all of this weight goes into this pyrolysis unit. Um, in terms of the products or output, you get the biochar. This is the actual grape mark uh, biochar that is produced. Um, then there is liquid uh, um, uh, product, which, which we call as that bio oil. And there is, there is, there is a gaseous uh, product as well, which is a syn gas. And it, that can be cycled back or looped back into the pyrolysis process. And it, uh, it, it can be actually used to run that pyrolysis unit as well. 
Um, this is a very good representation of an entire biochar carbon cycle, which actually shows how the waste is actually mobilized, uh, utilized through the pyrolysis unit, and where each and every product can be used. And we'll actually uh, look at how, what are the usefulness of each and every product. Um, so before, before uh, we do that, I think it's, it's imperative to understand what actually is pyrolysis. So it's nothing but a thermal decomposition of any kind of a biomass. Uh, without the presence of any air or oxygen in it. So fundamentally, it's actually a chemical reaction um, before the combustion or the gasification that occurs into the first few seconds. And the main products that you would be looking at through the pyrolysis, whenever you put in any kind of a biomass or any kind of a waste is the biochar, the bio oil and the gas. So you get all the solid liquid and the gaseous products and all three products are extremely useful um, and in various ways. So these pyrolysis actually occurs at different temperatures and you can actually categorize them according to the operating temperatures. So if, you, if your temperature of the pyrolysis unit is about 450 degrees Celsius, that means you are heating at a very slow rate um, you, you are actually tending to get more of the solid residue, which is a biochar, compared to the other products. Now, if you increase your pyrolysis temperature to about 800 degrees Celsius, and in terms of, and in technical terms, it's called as flash or fast pyrolysis, where, where your heating rates are quite rapid, uh, very, very slow residence time of the, of the input feedstocks, and you are actually getting more of the gases, the syn gas that is generated. Somewhere between these two temperatures, which is at an intermediate temperatures, uh, even at a relative higher heating rates, your main product is going to be bio oil, which is a liquid, uh, um, a liquid product out of that pyrolysis. So this is a representation of the liquefaction via uh, pyrolysis. What you are looking here is biomass that you feed into the pyrolysis reactor. You get uh, biochar. Um, you, when you condense, you get bio liquid and bio oil. Now this uh, bio oil can be used for power generation um, application, generating electricity. Um, you also get out of the condensation is the syn gas. So the syn gas, um, can has the use into electricity generation, heating, cooling, but it also can be combusted and it uh, uh, gives you the heat as a product and it can be feeded into the pyrolysis unit and then again loops back. So you're not actually even wasting it, wasting anything out. Um, the biochar can, is an excellent uh, soil amendment. It can be used for various other applications as well. Um, there is also a small uh, amount of uh, research that has been initiated and has been done in, in terms of capturing hydrogen through catalytic conversion. So in, um, once, once any kind of a waste stream actually enters a pyrolysis uh, technology, there are multiple various uses that can be done at an industrial level, commercial level, and the products that are useful um, that actually has a versatile application uh, market as well. So this is just a, a tabular representation of what uh, nomenclatures are used in technical terms and in scientific literatures um, based upon the operating conditions of pyrolysis. So when you are at a slow pyrolysis, these are your operating conditions. And this is the amount of approximation of the product yield that you should be able to see. Um, if you have a faster pyrolysis, your temperature range is pretty much about this and then uh, so this particular table will show you the slow, fast, and flash pyrolysis. Flash is something that occurs at about 1,000 degrees Celsius, um, where you are actually tending to get more of the yield of the oil um, compared to the solid residue. So it depends upon your operating condition. You will actually vary your product yield as well. Um, now, pyrolysis, it can be um, done at a relatively smaller scale. Um, at remote location and uh, to in order to actually reduce all the transportation and handling costs. It can be built on site, it can be catered built to a winery um, usage. 
And also it can be mobile as well. So that way pyrolysis with the pyrolysis unit, a winery is not stuck to actually having the capital cost invested into it, but there's a mobile option as well. And it can be clubbed into a uh, few fewer wineries in the area and the mobile winery, mobile um, pyrolysis unit can actually um, travel through, through different wineries as well. So this is uh, one of the recent study that uh, we have done at the Central Queensland University uh, with the uh, red uh, grape mark. Um, and this was a material that we, that we have tested. Um, so this is, this is how we do. We actually air and solar dried it um, in order to reduce all of that moisture content that it came with to about 20 to 25% before it went into the pyrolyzer. Uh, this is the unit that we have on site, uh, the pyrolyzing unit. Um, so this is how uh, uh, it actually visually appears. The, the, the waste stream actually goes into the unit. Um, you get the gaseous product you can see here. It's a very, very clean looking syngas. There's a biochar, beautiful looking biochar that has been produced because we were running at a certain temperatures about 450 to 500 degrees Celsius. We have gotten more yield of the biochar compared to the oil. So this is a bio oil that came out actually from this. Um, the, uh, one of the uh, very interesting usage of this bio oil is also uh, to actually, uh, it can be upgraded into uh, diesel fuel or jet fuel. So you can get actually biodiesel as well. And one of our application through this current study is also to be applied into a power generation engine and an automotive engine as well, which will actually see the upgradation of this particular oil into the um, diesel fuel as well. Um, now, all talking all of that, that how uh, interesting the pyrolysis technology is and what are the usage and how, how we can use it at different operating condition. Um, it also is very important and it's helpful to understand uh, some of the economic analysis that the scientific literature has also shown. So uh, across all of the binary sizes, the pyrolysis has shown to significantly require very low capital cost, approximately about 50% of the combustion, um, combustion technologies. Um, it is also uh, has uh, pyrolysis uh, technology has also shown a net positive cash flow for the wineries uh, with, with the grape crush of around greater than 1000 tons. So something about medium to large wineries, uh, because that has been associated or attributed due to their reduced capital cost involved and their uh, greater return of investment. And this advantage uh, keeps on improving when, when you go towards the larger wineries or uh, higher cr grape crush wineries. Um, the value, uh, according to the literature, the value of the grape, grape uh, sorry, the value of the bio, biochar has been estimated to about 200 to about $3,000 per ton. So in a way you can actually sell it or you can actually use it. There are uh, multiple usage of it. A um, lot of material processing and steel industries, they actually want a lot of bio, biochar um, in because uh, because in their material processing usage as well. So if you have to produce that that deal, you are, you know which kind of operating conditions that you want to use your pyrolysis unit at. Um, and the value of bio oil has been estimated to about three hundred and twenty dollars a ton. So um, in terms of the pyrolysis, uh, in terms of the carbon dioxide, so for um, the uh, pyrolysis unit, pyrolysis produces about 140 kilos of carbon dioxide equivalent per ton of the mark, which is even less than if there was one ton of the compost, uh, composting done for that particular mark. Um, and hence it actually, it's even uh, in relatively looking at that's, uh, that's quite smaller than the composting of the mark itself if it's done. So in terms of the carbon dioxide equivalent, you can actually, it has been reported that it's even lesser for the same amount of that uh, mark that is composted. Um, uh, pyrolysis yields about 150 kilos of biochar and 140 kilos of bio oil per ton of grape mark. So these are some of the heat based on the heating values that have been reported. Um, and it has the bio oil itself has an energy capacity of about 0.89 to 0.9 megawatt hour per ton of grape mark. 
So that's that's something that is a uh, an interesting um, areas for exploring into the electricity and power generation application as well to use the liquid fuel. Um, in concluding remark, from our study that we have done for the for the grape mark, we saw that there was ten percent of bio oil that we could produce and. Um, we are going to be using it for power generation engine. So the usage is for these kind of bio oil, you can use it in power generation engine, you can upgrade it to a biodiesel fuel. The oil is compatible with the oil refinery output as well. There was 30% of the biochar that was yield. Um, it, it's an excellent soil amendment usage. It can be used for carbon batteries, for carbon sequestration. As I said, it can be used to make the charcoal for the steel and material processing industries activated carbon as well. Um, there is 30% of syngas, which is again used for producing electricity, heating or cooling, and it can be recuperated back to the pyrolysis so that um, there's a continuous closed loop of uh, the, it becomes a cyclic loop of the energy um, and it can be run on the same uh, combusted heat as well. In short, we believe that pyrolysis gives the greatest opportunity for conversion of waste as compared to any other method. And um, the use of these products as uh, an alternative energy sources will be offsetting significant amount of energy that is produced from fossil fuels with a carbon neutral energy source. Um, I, I insist uh, from, what, for, from the studies that we have done that grape and wine producers should be using pyrolysis as an effective waste conversion technology. And significantly, this will help the vineyard and the winery uh, industries to actually think about how we can mitigate uh, the concerns that are there with the climate change. So pyrolysis is one of, uh, is one of the very smart technology that needs to enter and penetrate through the sector um, and it has shown economically viable as well. It has a lot of commercial and industrial application as well. So um, this is uh, in, uh, these are some of the references that we have uh, used. And I thank you all of the uh, audience to, for um, listening to this presentation. And I really thank Dr. Richard Smart for this uh, very smart initiative. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks, Ina. Great presentation, great data, uh, fantastic solution. And uh, I think that most importantly, it's not a kind of a sci-fi tech still far in time. There are already commercial solutions available to implement yep. it for um, everyone. So uh, yep. now let's see how consumers are perceiving all these <laughs> measures and how engaged they are with the cause. Uh, Richard yep. Halstead, co-founder and COO at Wine Intelligence that uh, studies and tries to understand consumer attitudes to wine, will tell us all. Uh, Richard, up to you now. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, thanks, Thiago. Uh, thanks also to Karen Hina for their um, uh, very interesting and thoughtful perspectives. Um, and obviously to Dr. Smart for arranging all of this and to the Porter Protocol uh, itself for being our hosts. Um, first of all, uh, Tiago, could you just confirm if you can see what I'm showing on the screen here? Uh, not yet. Okay. That's uh, confusing. <laughs> Let me just try that again. Um, Right, sharing that screen again. Just bear with me a second. Okay, there you go. Can you see it all now? Yes. And um, I'm just going to turn that into a slideshow. It's taking its sweet time about doing everything. Any luck? 
uh, it's still not on. It's like uh, still uh, logging, basically. So not yet, Richard, you're there. The Zoom link, I'm being able to see it. Okay. Sorry? It, it seems that the, the image uh, freezed basically. Uh, so. Uh... Okay, there seems to be an issue with the Zoom link. Um, uh, Marta, uh, is it possible for you to throw that presentation up from your end, please? Yes, I was just looking for it in order to try to do that. I'm just. Give me one second. And I will try to do that now. I'm opening it as I speak. Apologies to everyone, but you know how this goes with these new technologies. Some things are... Okay, I cannot start. Christina, that will have to be you because... Okay, uh, Richard, can you just stop sharing so I can do it? Yeah, mm -mm. that's it. You just have to stop sharing, uh, uh, Richard. Richard, are you there? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid your link is not listening to you now. Okay, you cannot, okay, I'll try to request. Let me see if I can. No, we're having problems here. Richard, are you there? Richard, can you stop sharing your screen? Okay. I think, okay, here we are. Richard, if you're there, your presentation is on. I think we lost Richard. Yeah, I think we did. Tiago, may I suggest while, t while uh, Richard is not here, should we just move on with some questions to, to Kiran and, 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 and Hina? Of course, I think that it will be uh, nice indeed. So um, let's start with, uh, we'll follow a little bit the order of, uh, of our uh, presentations. So I will begin uh, with uh, Kiran. Um, so first question will be, well, Kieran, um, I imagine that some people that um, first heard about our climate talk thought that uh, we would be most, mostly talking about uh, organic farming practices, uh, but we didn't so far. Uh, when you compare emissions of conventional and organic uh, viticulture, is the scenario so obvious as many believe? Yeah, so thanks, Tiago. That's a um, really interesting question. Um, so I believe general perceptions are that organic agriculture or organic viticulture in general has a lower environmental impact than conventional systems. Um, however, many studies, especially some out of Australia and Spain, have shown that organic vineyards actually had higher on-farm greenhouse gas emissions um, than that of conventional vineyards. Um, some reasoning behind this is that uh, more fuel was used when managing the organic vineyards, especially per hectare um, and per tonne of grapes, than for conventional vineyards. Um, increasing number of passes, uh, the tractors burning diesel, um, so more tractor passes means more CO2 emissions. Um, with electric tractors, um, which could potentially in the future be recharged using renewable electricity. Um, this may help to change this equation in the future. Um, but on this topic, it's I think it's really important to consider that climate change is one of many environmental categories. Um, so when making changes to practices or considering the pros and cons of each practice, you need to look broadly at a range of environmental impacts. And these include like water use and, and water footprint, similar to carbon footprint, um, land use, ecotoxicity, um, eutrophication, and, and many others. So, um, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, Ina, also your uh, presentation, I think that made us all think about uh, 
a couple of environmental and uh, economic uh, aspects. I would love to get some of your uh, insights also. Uh, so, uh, well, alternative sources of uh, energy to fossil fuels uh, have been winning more and more advocates and users, but uh, are still also not immune to some uh, criticism. Uh, a good example, for example, is uh, electric cars. Uh, many refer that production life cycle, uh, the disposal of batteries may have also an equal or even stronger carbon footprint when compared to standard internal uh, combustion uh, engine, in, engine models. Uh, so pyrolysis requires specific units and specific uh, working conditions. So it may raise some similar questions. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Well, as I said, the pyrolysis, um, unlike the internal combustion engines, um, they so internal, com we can't, it's, it's not a, a direct comparison of the pyrolysis unit to the internal combustion engines because one is an application, one is a producing um, unit. Now, um, with pyrolysis, the flexibility is to actually design or have a unit operate at different operating conditions. So if someone has uh, a use of just, uh, uh, as I said, based on the table that I was presenting, uh, based on the operating condition, if someone has the use of only, um, you know, soil amendment um, and use of only charcoal or biochar, then they are bound to actually just operate the pyrolysis unit at a certain operating conditions only. Now, it depends on what the usage is. Now, this pyrolysis unit is, is also not like a site bound. It can be actually, um, the, the capital cost is not just involved in building a pyrolysis unit because it can be mobile as well. Um, based, on the, based on the output conditions of how the technology uh, looks at in terms of the emissions or the gases that are uh, produced, um, unlike the internal combustion engines or the other combustion applications, where the greenhouse gas emissions are more of a concern with the pyrolysis um, that is that becomes less because one is that the gaseous components if if, there's, if if someone doesn't want to use it can be recuperated back cyclically within the unit itself so the the output of the pyrolysis is actually the input of the pyrolysis unit as well the gas can be looped into uh, the use of the uh, the other products, the liquid and the solids, can be actually varied depending upon the operating condition. So, um, in a way, it becomes a very holistic approach to actually look at pyrolysis unit as um, as a way to actually mobilize the waste, uh, reduce that amount, uh, and use into a useful product compared to just looking at into um, or even uh, comparing it to any of those application based because. The products that are produced through the pyrolysis can be actually used uh, into internal combustion engines or power generation engines like turbines or something, uh, so something like that to actually generate the electricity. Fantastic. Uh, so we have also a couple of questions. And I think that, well, okay, I think that actually now we have Richard uh, Halstead uh, ready to, to move forward. So uh, Richard, uh, up to you now. Thank you very much, everyone, um, and uh, apologies for the technicals there. Um, I'm uh, given the time that, uh, that we've got left. I'm just going to uh, uh, really just go to some of my central messages. So I think wh what I would say uh, is the, the kind of key takeout from what uh, Kieran and Hina were saying is that you know, actually technologically we've really got a handle now on uh, the carbon. Uh, life cycle within the winery and indeed within the, the total supply chain of, of wine. We've also got techniques now for mitigating that. Um, but the elephant in the room, as Dr. Smart uh, said, is um, really the packaging and particularly glass packaging. And I think my perspective was, was just coming from the point of view of I guess my experience in, in looking at consumer behavior in this sector, uh, which is the, the role that I, I play within the industry, um, and really sort of kind of being honest with ourselves and saying, actually, we've not really made the case for uh, how carbon uh, and, and indeed uh, how packaging, um, uh, how the two are connected. Um, in the consumer's mind, 
um, we have two major problems right now. One is inertia and the other is ignorance. And I'm just going to show you a couple of bits of data which explains what I mean by that. Um, so next slide, please, Marta or Christina. Uh, and just if you click there. So uh, first of all, I, I think when we first started looking at this seriously, which is about nine years ago, we noticed that um, most people still bought glass wine bottles, which was great um, uh, uh, for, for everybody. Everyone thought that glass wine bottles were good, but they also bought uh, other things as well. So bag in box, for instance. Um, if we wind the clock on to 2020, and this is for the UK, and this is recalled usage by consumers, it's the same uh, uh, sampling uh, process in both years. So the two are comparable on uh, a, a statistical uh, significance uh, analysis. The usage rate in 2020 for bag and box was actually down to around 16%, um, according to our data. Um, there was uh, a standard glass bottle was down at 82%. Um, but we had other types of glass bottle, like 500 mil glass bottle, that, that didn't really exist in 2012, but is now um, around a quarter of the population said they bought wine in that format. Um, so if, and this is just an illustration, but if we were trying to explain to people how wine uh, packaging uh, was uh, a, an influence on climate change and actually by switching from, let's say, standard glass to uh, bag and box was a good idea. Um, you know, this is just one market, but the global uh, view pretty much shows a very similar picture, which is people are mo no more likely to buy bag and box now than they were a decade ago. And in many markets, actually, they're less likely. At the same time, uh, we know that far more people are aware of climate change and indeed of the importance of looking at uh, carbon as uh, or CO2 emissions as a major contributor to that and how to mitigate it. And the data I've just got here is, is uh, uh, you, the standard Google Analytics search for climate, for the words climate change. So Google search terms for climate change, which have just about doubled in, in the, the period of time between uh, the first set of data that we collected and the, uh, uh, and the second set. Um, that big spike in 2019 is Greta Thunberg, by the way. Um, and what, what I think we can recognize here is that if there is a message about carbon and CO2 and how important it is to look at the, the emissions from that as a, as a, uh, a way of mitigating climate change, I don't think the message has really got through into the wine category. And I think that it's interesting to just consider why that might be. So one of the other data points we collected in 2012 and then again in 2020 was the perception of environmental friendliness of the different wine packaging products. Um, and as you can see here, uh, around 30% of people in 2012 thought that actually uh, what standard 750 mil glass bottles were environmentally friendly. Um, and uh, by 2020, that had fallen to around 14%. But still 14% of people said, uh, and we actually changed the wording slightly, we said it is, it, standard glass is better for the environment. And uh, do you agree with that? 14% um, of people did so. So maybe we could say, okay, some of the message might be getting through in terms of perception because uh, we've effectively halved the, the amount of people who think that uh, uh, standard glass bottles are good for the environment. At the same time, uh, in 2012, 40% of people thought that uh, bag and box was environmentally friendly. Uh, only 18% think that now. Um, so that's a, a, a bit of a head scratch. Uh, and also, it doesn't really help our cause. Now, there are many, many reasons why that might be. Um, and also many reasons why uh, people may not even uh, understand or care uh, about it. And, that, and I think that's probably the biggest issue that we face um, because I, I, and I'm not gonna dwell on the stuff on the right of this slide because 
I think Kieran's done a far more effective job. This is actually a New York Times analysis from a while ago. Um, and uh, what we what we can uh, all agree is that the reality of alternative packaging form, formats for wine, particularly things that are lightweight and uh, more efficient in terms of their packaging, are far better for uh, the, the, the environment in terms of CO2 emissions than your standard glass bottle. Um, however, that message hasn't got through. Right, so what do we do about it? Uh, next slide, please, Christina. Um, and this really, I, I, in some ways, it, this builds on uh, uh, the some of the information that was presented at the uh, Porto uh, Protocol Climate Change Conference in 2019. And I was struck at the time I, I interviewed uh, a the technical director of uh, Marks and Spencer, which is a large UK retailer, uh, a guy called Paul Wilgos. And, and Paul was fairly unvarnished in his assessment of how uh, well, basically how, how efforts to reduce the impact of climate change had, had failed. And one of the things he said was that basically, if you make it difficult for people to do something, they won't do it. If you make it uh, not something that, that seems to benefit them personally, they won't do it. So my proposal is make it uh, easy, make compliance no brainer and make it personal. How do you do that? Um, I've just got a couple of examples here to share with you just in, in, in the moment, a couple of moments I've got left. Um, you use uh, sensible technology to solve a problem that previously was being solved by plastic or things that were not good for you. So Carlsberg, uh, instead of putting those plastic rings on, uh, on, on six packs of beer, just used a little bit of, 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 of low impact glue and sorted the, the, the problem out. It achieved the same effect, just didn't involve plastic. Um, people thought, well, this is an easy idea because it's less to throw away. Um, AB InBev um, uh, just cut 30 grams off its beer bottle weight, um, but you can imagine how many beer bottles AB InBev gets through in a year. Um, and that amounted to, um, I, I, I have a feeling, uh, over uh, uh, 2 million uh, tons of CO2 taken out or something like that. I mean, you know, to, to, it's getting on for what Kieran was describing as the entire output of the Australian wine industry in terms of carbon. Um, so nobody noticed was my point. Um, and here's an example from another another field, but in another, uh, not, not necessarily mitigating carbon. So uh, in the UK, we, we introduced a, a tax on sugar in soft drinks in 2018. And um, the uh, sales of, of uh, sugary drinks at, over the tax threshold, which was five grams per 100 milliliters, fell by half after the sugar tax was introduced. And this sugar tax was only um, about, uh, it was about 20p per litre. Um, and uh, so, you know, you would say, well, that's not really going to make much of a difference. Well, it made an incredible difference. So essentially, uh, the, uh, the the amount of, uh, uh, of sugar in drinks as a whole also fell by about 40%. So it went, fell from an average of about 4.4 grams per 100, uh, per 100 mil um, to uh, about 2.9. Um, so even just a small impact like that had a huge effect. And it was because people just didn't want to pay uh, a little bit more for their soft drinks. And Manufacturers also found ways of um, making those drinks not taste too not sugary um, and, uh, and solve the problem. So compliance is a no brainer. Final point, if we make it personal, um, so personal being how I personally benefit, uh, maybe I save money, maybe I'm, I feel cleverer than other people, or maybe I'm doing this for the, for the betterment of myself. Uh, I've got a few examples there. The reusable shopping bags uh, uh, case study is, is fantastic. It's it, it, a remarkable example of uh, how human behavior can be changed by just simply saying you have to pay 10 uh, euro cents or 10, 10 P for uh, a plastic bag um, and created in, an entire behavior change where people take now take their own bags to supermarkets and shops and so forth. Um, and then there's this other very strong movement, particularly apparent amongst younger consumers, 
which is about making positive lifestyle choices for themselves. And if you can fit an idea about how you choose, what product you choose and how you choose it and so forth into that positive lifestyle choice, um, you, you, you may find uh, some success. Um, my final point uh, is just to, I expose strike a, strike a note of optimism in this group. So we know that climate change is a, is a very real phenomenon. We also know that uh, there are actions that we can do to mitigate it. Governments also know this now. Governments are taking action. They're going to introduce a, a, a carbon tax. There's no question in, in anyone's mind that's going to happen. It's just a question of how, when, and, and what, what impact it's going to have on us. As an industry, we also know how to reduce the, the, the carbon footprint. When carbon taxes come in, there will be a price-based or a, a personal impact for consumers on what they buy and how they buy it. And the challenge for us now is to try and move our uh, kind of packaging strategy towards something that consumers are going to find easy to do. So it make compliance a no-brainer and make it a personal positive choice. Um, so that's my challenge to us all. Um, and uh, I do apologize if we uh, run over a couple of minutes, but uh, 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 thank you very much for at least giving me the opportunity to speak um, towards the end of your session. Tiago, back to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you, Richard, for uh, quite a revealing presentation. Uh, I think we all thought that the awareness of the consumer when it comes to these issues was probably way deeper than it seems. Uh, it definitely shows that there's still a lot to do. So uh, this concludes the presentations of today's speakers, but uh, we're again open for discussion and to answer the questions of, uh, that our audience also may have. Uh, first, I will pose also just another question before uh, opening also the, 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 the discussion to the attendees that, uh, that, uh, that we have here. And so this will be precisely to, uh, to, 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 to Richard and um, Richard, you've mentioned that uh, consumers um, have a big resistance to change from glass to alternative packaging formats, uh, especially due to the fear that it may impact quality. Uh, but uh, we don't see that so much when it comes to, for example, food plastic packaging, where those same concerns could apply. Uh, but in that case, nobody seems to question that. If we want to see a real change, uh, do you think that uh, uh, more like kind of a guerrilla shocking campaign approach uh, as it happened for plastic should apply? Or should we just uh, answer instead to the quality concerns in the kind of like a, a reissue of that old uh, Pepsi challenge? Uh, can you tell the difference version glass bottle versus pouch? Yeah, so th there's a lot going on there, Thiago. Let me try and unpack it. For you, so uh, I think the the issue of perceived quality in uh, different form forms of packaging. So let's say just glass versus bag and box, um, it is uh, is clearly a perception that derives from, I suppose, two sources. The first is that historically, and I'm going back a long time now, actually there were problems with uh, wines that were stored in bag and box. The, 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 the technology was not as good as it is now, and you know, wines could uh, not necessarily spoil, but certainly not taste as fresh um, in that format. Um, technically, I think, or technologically, I think those problems have are, are largely been solved, um, but the perception might persist. So pe you know, people uh, could kind of seem to think about things in, in, in a very consistent way, over time and actually shifting that that attitude is, is quite often it's a bit like you know uh, 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 kind of drilling through rock it's it's very persistent i think the second thing it's it's much less to do with the technology and much more to do with just the commercial reality which is for a lot of people bag in box wine isn't that interesting to them for, for two reasons the so first is there's not enough range. So the brands that they may prefer or like are not available in the bag and box format. And the second is they may not buy or want to buy as much wine in one go as a bag and box format typically offers. Um, and thirdly, 
they're still very much aligned with the idea that wine in a glass bottle on a table with food and company is the sort of ideal uh, use case for wine. It, it, it is uh, uh, an aspirational beverage that's uh, dealt with in a social setting. And having a box of wine on the table, I know you could put it into a decanter or a jug or whatever, but that doesn't quite feel the same to people. And then there's actually an interesting question that might Wilson's just raised in the in the chat, which is whether people actually with certainly with uh, plastic bottles, uh, which I haven't really talked about because they're not really a factor at the moment in the wine industry, and indeed the plastic associated with bag and box packaging, might also be a factor because pa plastic packaging has become the you know the sort of uh, the, the kind of evil ogre of um, the world at the moment, I irrespective of, of climate change and carbon, uh, there's been a, a, a huge sort of uh, uh, and widespread um, uh, campaign against uh, the, the proliferation of plastic packaging. Um, and plastic is seen as, as you know, very much the, the, the villain of the piece. Glass, on the other hand, consumers still think glass is, a, is actually a good idea. They don't recognize the uh, impact of on the carbon uh, uh, output of a, a glass bottle because they think it's easy to recycle. It was one of the first products ever to be able to be recycled. And they think of it as a quote, natural product because well, it's made from sand and, and they think that by recycling it, they're actually doing a really good job. So I think it's a really complicated issue, Thiago, not one that necessarily can be dealt with through you know, a sort of simple kind of shock marketing. Very good. Thanks, Richard. So we have now also a couple of questions from our um, attendees. Uh, and so I can select here a couple that uh, I think that it will be important also to, to discuss. So uh, Antonio Martins has a question for Kieran. And so he asks, Kieran, are there new improved carbon accounting tools for the carbon emitted by fertilizers and by agricultural practices, such as tiling? Uh, there is an old carbon calculator and OIV has some guidelines, but um, agricultural practices is still a, a kind of dark area. So, uh, Kieran, can you uh, help us with that? Yeah, thanks, Antonio. And and understandably, it's still a area that is is trying to be advanced and obviously trying to keep up your carbon accounting um, associated with changes within. Um, within viticultural practices and also winery practices. So um, to be honest, I would need to um, follow up on that question and I'm happy to take that offline and um, provide you with any information that I find. But I, I do know that carbon accounting tools uh, are trying to uh, keep up, um, but with different advancements and, and um, especially within, within the vineyard and at the winery and, and also looking um, across different countries and um, on a global scale, um, sometimes that they can potentially um, miss spots here and there. But um, yeah, I'm definitely happy to take that offline and, and follow up for you. Great, thanks, Kieran. Uh, so now we have also um, Mike Wilson uh, asking something also to, to, to Richard. So Richard, do you think a, a key driver for the drop in environmental friendliness uh, associated with the uh, BIB has been driven by the multi-material components and use of plastic within the packaging. Could plastic be the driver for the for this decline? Uh, well, as I, I just typed an answer to, to Mike on that, and I, 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 there isn't enough evidence really for us for me to, to comment definitively um, on that hypothesis. Um, I, I would imagine it is a factor, but I suppose the question is: is it the dominant factor? Um, and uh, I, uh, my hypothesis going into that would be that perhaps some other other things are more dominant. So lifestyle choices, for instance, people not wanting to drink as much alcohol as they used to. Um, why buy a big container of alcohol if you're trying to cut down? I think you know that that's probably more of a driver of people moving away from bagging box. You know, you've also got alternative. Uh, uh, or other alternative formats of, of, of wine uh, packaging that weren't really 
a factor 10 or 12 years ago, you've got wine in cans. Admittedly, it's not a big thing at the moment, but it is gaining ground, uh, you know, from a relatively small niche. You've got wine in pouches, you've got uh, uh, the sort of paper cardboard uh, bottles. So people trying to make positive um, environmental choices now have more things to choose from. And people also making lifestyle choices for themselves, like how much wine do I actually want, also have alternatives uh, to, to choose from. So I, I would say it, it's more of a complex picture than, than, than simply uh, a sort of anti-plastic uh, movement. Um, but I, I would imagine that is also a factor. Very good. So now I have also a question to, to, to Hina. Um, and so I, and now I'll change a little bit the, the, the winemaker's hat to, uh, to a CFO hat instead. Uh, Hina, you've mentioned that pyrolysis gives a net positive cash flow for wineries with a grape crush uh, below or, or over uh, 1,000 tons. Um, so uh, doing some quick, quick maps uh, and according to your data in Australia, that represents around uh, 100 uh, wineries and uh, roughly around 60% of the total mark produced. Uh, so what about the other 40% uh, that actually covers around uh, 2,000 wineries instead? So uh, if having a pyrolysis unit may not yet be economically uh, viable, viable for, uh, for smaller mid-sized wineries, what may be the solution for this very significant share? Uh, do you think that should it be service providers like collect and transform, just transform, shared units? Uh, what do you have to say? Thanks, Diego. So, <clears throat> in in this scenario, uh, for the for the wineries that have the grape crush uh, less than thousand tons, um, they can they are still um, they have still shown a positive. Uh, uh, out, uh, output through the pyrolysis, but there is a there, there's another thing that these kind of wineries or this uh, this particular um, percentage of the sector can actually fall into using the uh, mobile units because mobile units are something that that's a that that's a smarter solution for the the small and the medium uh, size wineries who can actually uh, don't want to install the pyrolysis unit on site and. Um, the, the one one sub solution is to use a mobile pyrolysis unit and that has been done um, that has been picking up now and I think that's one of the um, having a mobile pyrolysis unit for someone who actually uh, wants to use it at a certain period of time in a year and then it actually can be used collectively where uh, different wineries can come together from the similar area and the and the mobile pyrolysis unit. Uh, can, can be used to mobilize that way. So one of the solution is to use a mobile pyrolysis unit for someone, for support the wineries that have the lesser um, uh, grape crush. Great, thanks, Ina. So now we have also, uh, well, I hope the contribution of our uh, great students as well. They've been uh, really, really uh, fantastic to be during their examination uh, time also to be here with us and to be able to, to, to make also some, uh, some very, very uh, important questions as well. And so I think I have here already Barbara that uh, would uh, love to make one and uh, actually even net two questions. Uh, that, okay, very good. And actually, Barbara, you can do it yourself. We, uh, we have the, the technical means for that, so <laughs> even better. And then we have a more direct uh, conversation altogether. So, Barbara? I have two questions. The first one is how to minimize CO2 emissions during wine transportation and how to improve logistic during distribution. And the second one is um, the impact of reused wine bottles instead of recycling, recycling bottles. Fantastic. So I think that we can address that to the, to, to the whole panel. So um, Kieran, do you want to begin? Yeah, of course. Thank you for the questions, Barbara. Um, I'll address the first one. Um, with regards to reducing, um, it was in relation to reducing emissions during um, sort of export of wine. 
Um, so I covered this a little bit in the presentation with regards to um, exporting in, in bulk has, has greater uh, emission reduction than actually exporting um, bottled wine. Um, and a lot of this comes down to the transportation of that additional weight um, as per some of the slides. Um, if we saw exporting um, lightweight bottles, even 330 grams versus um, 750 gram bottles, um, we saw a huge reduction in the, um, in the transport emissions. Um, the limitations with exporting in, in bulk um, can be around the export market, wherever that may be, having the capability to package that wine. Um, so some of those logistical, excuse me, logistical challenges um, can be around making sure that you're comfortable with packaging your wine within, um, within a certain export market. Um, and also that the export market is, is um, uh, built up in a way that it can, it can handle either the, the volume or, um, or uh, the labeling characteristics that your product needs. I'll let Richard or Hina um, comment on that one as well. Richard, do you want those to well to, to, to contribute? I think I'll leave it to Hina actually. Um, it, okay. it, it's beyond my pay grade. So Okay, fantastic. Hina. So um, I think there was a there was a there was a question about the CO2 transportation, is it? Can can you repeat that question? Yes, Mara. Yes. Um, I ask how to minimize the emission of CO2 uh, during transportation and how to improve logistic during the distribution. Yeah, so minimizing the CO2 during the transportation, again, th th this is um, once, once a cleaner fuel, uh, and this, this is again an ongoing uh, um, research uh, um, that, that, is, that has been since uh, now a couple of uh, decades about the clean fuel. So um, it, it, it all has to do uh, through, the, uh, through the, for example, technically, it's... Uh, to reduce the emissions through the uh, through the transportation or a power generation sector, it's it's about uh, how how it's uh, what kind of fuels are used, or how what kind of technology is used, and how the combustion is done. So, with the pyrolysis uh, products that have been used, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the biochar has shown a great carbon neutral strategy. Um, uh, on the other side, the bio oil that has been uh, that that is actually produced through the waste streams and through the pyrolysis um, that that is considered to be a cleaner fuel. So once you upgrade it to a biodiesel or a diesel fuel, depending upon what application you want to use, or just blending it with the diesel as well, using it any kind of an application, the transport application or the um, the power application, um, the research has shown that the cleaner fuels have um, have shown reduced. Uh, uh, comparatively uh, reduce emissions uh, compared to any of those uh, the regular fossil fuels. So though that is the that is an application strategy to actually uh, show the minimized or reduced uh, emissions uh, through those products that have been produced through the pyrolysis. Very good. So, and an uh, extra score for our great students uh, in the final exam because they did a, a great, great question as well. Uh, we have now here also a question from uh, Louis Rochard uh, to Richard. Uh, Richard, what type of surveys do you have about consumers' sustainable choices and perceptions about the wine industry? So we survey um, every year uh, a, a representative sample of consumers in about 15 countries uh, about their attitudes to packaging. So that's where the data that I showed you comes from. Um, we also it, it separately survey them about perceptions of um, things like sustainability, environmental uh, friendliness, organic, biodynamic, um, etc., and whether they're um, uh, buying products that uh, have that designation. Um, so we track this stuff, you know, pretty uh, regularly, um, typically once a year, and we have done for most of the last 10 years. By the way, Richard, do you believe that um, government should also take more measures and also kind of 
course, a change like happened, for example, with the food, sugar content, salt. Uh, we know that some are actually already doing that. Canada, for example, uh, where yeah. Quebec's uh, governmental monopoly is the SAQ, uh, which is one of the biggest wine buyers in the world, uh, first created strict criteria for suppliers to reduce bottles wave and now is actively making tenders and giving priority to the listing of wines in packaging that with the proof to reduce carbon footprint. Yeah. Uh, do you think that legislation is the solution or a real change of mentality would make it more lasting? Well, I think I think it's fair to say, I mean, I obviously get into trouble for saying this because as an industry, we, we tend to want to resist government interference in what we do. Um, but I, 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 to be honest, uh, you know, legislation and, and indeed taxation is probably the catalyst for change. Um, we've seen this in a number of other areas um, over the years and you know, it's, it's all very well for people to come up with sort of, you know, voluntary, thoughtful initiatives. But, you know, the reality is if that increases their cost of goods and decreases perhaps the, the, their ability to compete effectively in, in an open market, then it's going to be a struggle, right? you know, that unless there is a very strong consumer uh, pull through of that, you know, of, of a certain behaviour. So, you know, we've seen some growth in, in things like organic wine, which, um, uh, you know, and, and that's a whole nother topic because, you know, is that more, more or less carbon intensive? I'm not gonna get into that, but if we just use that as an example, more people buy organic wine now than did 10 or 20 years ago. And, and, and partly that's to do with the, the needs and the expressed desires of consumers around the world who are interested in buying things that are better for them and better for the environment. So there's certainly a movement towards that. But if you look at where things have really changed, it's when that sort of underlying desire has been combined with a sort of top down approach where either through uh, regulation or taxation and probably the best working example that I can think of at the moment is the uh, decision by uh, System Belaget in Sweden to uh, favor the listings of organic wines in its uh, uh, assortment. So when it publishes tenders um, and uh, their goal was, I think, to increase the uh, proportion of organic wines sold from, I think it was about 10% in the early 2010s to 20% by 2020. Um, and they achieved that goal about four years ahead of where they thought they were going to simply by just promoting uh, organic wines in their tendering process and in, in the store. Um, and they didn't need to do anything else. They just made a point of saying, this is stuff that's, you know, you, you ought to be looking at, you know, population of Sweden who goes to System Belaget. And it was very effective. And so I, I do believe that, that that sort of overcoming of the inertia that, w that I'm describing that we need to achieve if we're going to do anything about this, probably part of that nudge, that, that sort of catalytic effect has to come from government. Okay, great. So I think that uh, that was it. Um, I would like to thank uh, all the intervenients. So Kieran, uh, Hina, Richard Alstead, Dr. Richard Smart, and of course, Proto Protocol. Martin and Christina for uh, your work and active actions to this important cause. Uh, also to our attendees and to UTAB for the means that made the, so the University of Tazimunch for the means that made available to us here. Um, I believe that we all leave this climate talk with the sense that there are great people, great minds working hard for an effective change towards mitigation but uh, we must all do our share. Uh, it's not enough just to buy organic or to avoid plastic. There's so much more that we can all do. Again, we owe it to our future generations and to our fantastic planet. So best wishes to everybody. And now final words to our dear Marta. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone on the other side of the screen for bearing with us. First of all, because we took way longer than we generally do, but I think it's 
We just kept everyone here from what I see. And also, sorry for the technical problems. It's part of these new digital conferences that we have nowadays. I'm not going to summarize, although I'll, I'll just keep an eye. I think we've never had such a complete climate talk in, such a, in, in terms of topics. And there are two messages that come out actually from what Richard was saying that regulations and the trade are absolutely key players in making this work in making climate action way more active. And in regards to that, actually, I'll, I'll leave you a note to our next business, uh, to our next climate talk on July 22nd, because two of the guests that are already confirmed really cover not the regulations part, but part of a lot of what we've been talking about today, because one is Paulo Zvedu uh, is the chairman of two uh, really important companies that have to do with the topics that we were talking here today. He's the chairman of BA Glass, which is one of our members that is a glass producing company of glass bottles. And he's also the chairman of uh, one of our biggest retail companies in Portugal, Sonai. So we'll be actually be able to address some of these issues that we uh, spoke about here today. And we'll also have Carlo Mondavi, and he's the he's one of the founders and uh, CEO, uh, COO of Monarch Tractor, which is one of the uh, electric tractors, tractors that has just been launched and also addresses part of the issues that we were we talked about here today. Now, thank you a lot. I think your, your presentations were really thorough and, uh, and it was so interesting to have on one hand the science and then Richard addressing how the consumer with whom we cannot live without uh, especially if he doesn't change his consumer habits, it will be more difficult for producers to do it, to, to give a completely different view of what Kieran and Hina presented. And thank you so much, Tiago, for being able to bridge science and a language that is completely understandable for consumers and producers alike, because we're all consumers at the end of the day. And thank you so much, Dr. Richard. I don't know if you want to nudge just Thank you so much for this initiative. And it was such a different and important approach for here, for us to have here at Porto Protocol. Thank you everyone that bared with us on the other side of the screen. Everything you saw today will be made available in the next few hours actually. And we'll see you very soon. And as you know, we'll just end up this uh, session very abruptly and we'll be with you very soon again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.